Let's get rolling. If you're ready to go, say, let's go. Let's go. Fantastic. I'm considering taking you with me. Okay, let's talk about setting goals. A subject that altered my life forever. It was just unbelievable. I hadn't known my mentor, Mr. Show, very long until one day he said, Mr. Ronsch, let me see your current list of goals. He said, I've had a lot of experience and I've been out here for a while. And he said, let's go over them and maybe I can really give you some good ideas. And I said, I don't, I don't have a list. He said, well, he said, if you don't have a list of your goals, he said, I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars which he did. That got my attention. I said, you mean my bank balance would be a lot bigger if I learned how to set goals? He said, drastically bigger. That got my attention, so I finally said, hey, I want to learn how to set goals. It is a fantastic skill to develop how to design your own future. So make the note, life best lived is life by design, not by accident. Not just, you know, walking through the day careening from wall to wall and managing to survive. You know, that's okay. But if you can start giving your life dimensions and design and color and objectives and purpose, the results can be absolutely staggering. Key phrase, here's a chance now to use your imagination. Because the imagination builds cities. Imagination conquers disease. Imagination develops a career. Imagination sets up a relationship. Imagination is where all tangible values and intangible values begin in the imagination. So what you've got to learn to do is use this powerful resource. Now, sometimes all by ourselves, it's a little difficult sort of to get it going. That's why... A little workshop like we're going to do today is sometimes very helpful when someone does a little coaching and says, how about this, this niche? You say, I never thought about that. That ought to be easy to do. And the first thing you know, you're going. All the stuff I've done, this is not any new stuff. You know, you could have thought of all this in your lifetime. But in a concentrated way, like two days, if somebody comes along and says, how about, jot this down, you say, yes, I can understand that. I thought about that and I sort of dismissed it. That's why two days is so valuable, or one day, or whatever, a seminar, so that somebody takes you through some things that you could have thought of by yourself, you could have done your own research, but why not capsulize an event like this for a couple of days, and then go through it and let it stimulate you to widen your life, whether it be your career, or a relationship, or financial independence, or a project that you're working on, whatever that is, this kind of time is so valuable. And it's true, it's why, why the cassettes are so valuable. Brian Tracy is right. It's called University on Wheels. Turn your car into a mobile classroom and just get this stuff, right? When your hands are busy and your mind is free, you know, why not utilize that time to learn another subject, to pick up another skill, to be reminded of another important value in your life that being so busy has got you distracted. It, it's a unique way to do that, right? Not just to sell cassette tapes but because it's a great way to pick up the extra learning and increase the momentum of your upward curve of self-development and uh, self-education. And uh, that's why that is so important. But now, tapping this resource of the imagination and thinking about your future, thinking about tomorrow, as early as tomorrow or the rest of the day, and thinking on out the rest of the year, on into the next century, on into the early years of the next century. A workshop like we're about to do helps call your attention to that so you can use your imagination to start prospecting for the future, what could be possible for you. So let's go through some things. Here's number one. We're affected by five things primarily. Number one, the environment, which affects us all. It doesn't hurt to make a simple contribution to the environment. Pick up a piece of trash and throw it in the receptacle. If everybody did that, what a better world it would be. A little contribution that costs nothing. I finally learned how simple it was to turn out the lights before I left my hotel room, to make a contribution. 
How much time does it take? Just a fraction of a second. Saves a little more electricity. What if everybody did it? Maybe the cost of a room might come down. If everybody contributed and everybody said, well, the hotel's going to benefit. Here's the answer to that. What difference does it make? What difference does it make if it's easy for you to make a contribution if you don't make it? Say, no, I leave all the lights on. You know, it's the hotel, not me anyway. Then you have the wrong attitude. The attitude is, if it's easy for me to conserve, if it's easy for me to do something that becomes my daily and yearly and life routine, what it does for my psyche, what it does for my self-esteem, even though it's quiet self-esteem, it's not publicized, it's not something you're recognized for, you know, in front of an audience of 10,000, but it's something that you recognize, here's the kind of person I am, whether anyone ever sees it or not. Here's the things I do that helps to accelerate my own self-esteem. I don't need public recognition. I don't need a, a pin for it. You know, I don't need a Congressional Medal of Honor. I have enough dignity to give myself honor for the things I do that make a contribution, whether anyone else does it or not. Now, it's easy to say, well, no one you know, turns out the lights. Say, no one but me. I'm one of those rare individuals. And that doesn't have to be publicly recognized. Just so in your heart and soul, you know you are one of those rare individuals that does these little things. So we're affected by the environment. Next, we're affected by events. Some small, some big, some personal, some national, some global. The hurricane. What's the name? Dennis. Heading for the east coast of America. Looks like it might turn and go north, but events affect us all. How about the missile crisis? Some of us go back that far, right? Some of you got gray hair like me. Russia tries to sneak their missiles into Cuba. Kennedy finds out about it and calls and says, Nikita, John Kennedy on the line, you can't put your missiles in Cuba. Nikita Khrushchev said, Mr. President, you're young at this game. This is Nikita Khrushchev. This is Russia you're talking to. We can put our missiles wherever we darn well please. Wow, that started it. Next call, Mr. Khrushchev, sir, not in Cuba, 90 miles from America. Khrushchev says, well, Mr. Kennedy, I, I hate to inform you, but the ships are already on the way with the missiles. Next call, Mr. Khrushchev, John Kennedy. Sir, I must inform you, and you must hear me clearly. We will not let your ships arrive. Now it's getting tough. People are starting to dig bomb shelters, right, when they heard this scenario. Next call, Nikita Khrushchev says, Mr. Kennedy, I promise you, sir, if you touch those ships, you've got war. Last call. John Kennedy says, Mr. Chairman, please, sir, I promise you, if it is war, Russia will cease to exist. There won't be any more Russia. Last call. And Nikita decided he better take his missiles and go back home. And the world breathed a little easier. Right? Those kind of events affect us all. But they're small events and daily events and family events and national events and community events. We're all affected by the events. Here's number three. We're affected by knowledge. Whatever we know or don't know. Good phrase to jot down if you haven't done it before in one of my seminars. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is tragedy. Ignorance is devastation. Ignorance creates lack. Ignorance creates disease. Ignorance will shorten your life. Ignorance will empty your life, leave you with the husks, nothing to account for. Ignorance. Ignorance is not bliss. Here's another good one to note. What you don't know will hurt you. What you don't know will tragically affect your life. What you don't know will leave your life empty. What you don't know will leave you without a love affair or a relationship. What you don't know. So, we're all affected by knowledge, whether we know, whether we don't know. 
That's why you've got to read the books. Key phrase, the book you don't read won't help. Next, we're affected by results. Whatever results you're currently getting, the harvest of your own decisions, those are your current results. We're affected by those, whether it's financial results or personal results or social results. We're all affected by results. Disciplines undone in the future give us poor results. Discipline managed well gives us good results. Here's number five. We're affected by our dreams, our vision of the future. Next key. You want to make sure that the greatest pull on your life is the pull of the future. Some people live in the past and let their life be continually pulled and influenced by the past. And yes, we must remember the past and review the past to make it useful to invest in the future. But here's the key. Make sure that the greatest pull on your life is the pull of the future. Now, if you're skimpy on your dreams, if you're skimpy on your objectives and your purposes, if that isn't very well planned, then it doesn't pull very hard. Then you have more of a tendency to be pulled by the past or to be pulled apart by events or circumstances or to be pulled apart by distractions. So in order to save yourself from being pulled apart by distractions or pulled back to the past, you want to now start really designing the future so that the greatest part of your attention and focus and pull, like a magnet, pulls you forward into the future to accomplish your goals. But if you're weak in learning to set goals, if you haven't really worked on this that we're going to work on, then that is a solution you need to consider. Goals are like a magnet. They pull, and the stronger they are, and the more purposeful they are, the bigger they are, the more unique they are, the stronger they pull. If you have excellent goals and high dreams, here's what they also do. They pull you through. Pull you through all kinds of down days, down seasons. They pull you through a winter of discontent. They pull you through distraction on every side that says, look here, look here, look here. Strong, powerful dreams like a magnet pull you through that. Strong dreams and goals pull you through a disaster. Some people get swallowed by the disaster because they have nothing on the other side of the disaster to pull them through. A bad day can almost overwhelm you if you don't have something really purposeful to go for at the other side of that day. At the other side of the difficult time, at the other side of the down time. If you've got plenty out there, to attract and pull, it'll pull you through all these things. And very little of it will attach itself to you. You'll be able to get through some of the most difficult times if you have this spectacular vision ahead of you of where you're going and what you're going to accomplish. Getting through will be easy or easier. So learning to set goals, it is an incredible experience. Once I learned it, it transformed my life forever. Being here today is an accomplishment of my goals. When I travel around the world and sit on an airplane, I say, I dreamed about this one day. I used to go to the airport and watch the planes fly away, and I said, one of these days, I'll be on one of those planes. I dreamed about it. I dreamed about the other side of the world. I'd never been to Italy, but I dreamed about it. I'd never been to, to uh, Israel, but I dreamed about it. I'd never been to South Africa, but I dreamed about it. Never been to Australia, but I dreamed about it. And sure enough, step by step and country by country and flight by flight, I started checking them off my list. It was the most exhilarating feeling. Powerful to set those goals, reach out there into the future, design something to the best of your ability, refine it as you go, tear it up periodically if you want to, set a whole new list. It's your life. It's your future. But now I would like to do it in a very simple, easy manner that you can follow. And we're going to have to sort of push on through this workshop because we just don't have the time to make it very extensive. But I want it to serve as a model so that you can use it for the future to pass on to your children. Or if you've got a little group that you train and teach or your management and salespeople, you can use this with others. So what I'm going to go through with you here is sort of a model. Sort of if I rush you just a little bit on getting through this model, at least I will leave you with the model that you can use later. And not only use later, but use later to pass on to someone else in some manner. So, having laid this background now, here's what I want you to do. Get a fresh piece of paper. 
or a new page in your journal. And this is called now the workshop. And on this workshop now, I want you to write down the question and then do the exercise. Write down the question and then do the exercise. First question. List what five things have you accomplished that you're already proud of? What five things have you already accomplished that you're proud of? That is the question. My question to you. And now that you've written down the question, I want you to just make that list of five things that you can think of that you've already accomplished that you're proud of. Whatever it is, just so it's important to you. It doesn't have to be important to the world or important to me. Just so it's important to you. I graduated third in my high school class in my senior year. I was proud of that. Graduated third. Now, it's not, there's only three. It's not that good. I did a speaking tour once with David Chilton, who wrote The Wealthy Barber, and Mark Tewksbury, who was a gold medal winner in Canada. And uh, that was on Mark Tewksbury's list of five things I've already accomplished that I'm proud of. Winning the gold medal in Barcelona. So what have you accomplished? What five things have you accomplished that you're proud of? Now, primarily what this is for is to, you know, give you credit for what you've already accomplished. Shelf said to me, Mr. Owen, you've already been setting goals. You know, you've already gone for something and you've achieved it. But you've probably done it haphazardly. You haven't done it with a real plan in mind. And you've accomplished some things. Now, if you start deliberately doing it, can you imagine how you can multiply the effect by 5, by 10, by 20, by 100? I finally got the message. So, first of all, he wanted to make sure I got credit for the things that I had already accomplished, especially in my own mind. You know, whether it's an accomplishment to someone else doesn't matter now. Just so you recognize it for yourself, a list of those five things that I've already accomplished. When you work with kids on doing this little workshop, right, this will give them some credit. They'll feel good now about going through the rest of the program simply because you want to recognize what they've already accomplished on their own. You know, they haven't been through a class on setting goals. You know, they haven't been through a workshop. But, hey, we've all done maybe some pretty spectacular things. I wish we knew all the stories in this room. If we knew all the stories in this room, I'll bet you we'd, some of them we'd be dazzled of what some people in this room have already accomplished. Yes, they're sitting here in the seminar. Yes, we're about to do the goals workshop. But hey, plenty of you have done some outstanding things that's given you self-esteem and self-confidence. I congratulate you for that. Now that you've done that little workshop, here's the second question. This is going to take some time now. What do you want in the next... 10 years. What do you want in the next 10 years? Now, under this, what do you want in the next 10 years? That is the question. I want you to make a list of at least 50 items. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to just write as fast as you can. Don't give any much detailed thought to it of what you want in the next 10 years. And just let your mind run free. Now, also remember this. This is not what you think you can get. This is what you want. If it all fell into place and you could have everything you wanted in the next 10 years, what would you take? Right. If somebody promised you can have anything you want in the next 10 years, what do you want? I want you to approach it that way because it's not important to think, what do I think I can get? I want you to now think about what you want in the next 10 years. So we're going to take a little time now for you to make that list of 50 items. Just And put them one under the other, not side by side, but one under the other because we're going to do something with this list when you finish. One under the other. And abbreviate, you know, wherever possible so you can just put more items on the list. What do you want in the next 10 years?
everything from places to go to investments to make to education for your children. Personal things, business things, everything. Now, some of these things need to be tomorrow, need to be this year, need to be next year, then 10 years on out there. Between now and the next 10 years, what would really do it for you? Everything you can think of. Skills you want to learn. Languages. Residences you want to acquire. A ranch in Montana, a cabin in the mountains. Everything you can think of, from small to large. A list of the places you want to visit. Revisit. Experiences you want to have. Fly the Concord. Bungee jump. Something maybe you haven't done, but just put it on your list if it rings a bell. Write a song, write a book, write a poem. Ten years. Benevolence goals. Projects you want to support, money you want to be able to give. Star in a movie? Play in a rock and roll band? What would give you the most incredible life the next 10 years? A new wardrobe, a new look. Start a new family. Larry King. You know, he has breakfast where I have breakfast at Nate Nails. We've had a chance to talk a few times. He just start, he's starting a brand new family. I don't know how old he is next to God. I mean, he's getting pretty old, but it's unbelievable. Jerry Lewis, what, 72 or 73, and he's got a little girl? Danny's her name. Jerry Lewis, little girl. Now, maybe that wouldn't do it for you, but you know, what, what would do it for you? What would give you the greatest satisfaction, pleasure, joy, live an unbelievable life? What would that list be the next 10 years? You know, habits you want to change, health you want to acquire, And remember, if you've been to my other seminars, right, the little revenge I talk about on your goal list. I had some of that when I first started doing these goals, a little revenge. People who said I couldn't do it. Couldn't wait to get my new car, drive it up on their lawn. <laughs> Satisfaction. Budget finance used to harass me. I finally got the money put together, put it in the 
in small bills in a big briefcase. Walked into this guy's office one day, dumped this pile of money all over his desk, out of my briefcase. I said, count it. Turned around, walked out, never asked for a receipt. Someday you just got to bury somebody in the money. Satisfaction. David the king said, God prepares my table for me. What a scene. David said, God prepares my table for me. But that's not the end of the story. What's the rest of it? Got some scholars here. God prepares a table before me. What? In the presence of my enemies. See, you've got to put that on your list someday. The new translation reads, in their face. <laughs> Isn't that an incredible scene? In the presence of my enemies. Let them look at this scene. Whatever it is, satisfaction. My Japanese friend, Toru Ikeda, right here, San Jose, years ago, put on his first list, a Caucasian gardener. I said... <laughs> Go Toro. So good. So what would do it for you? Upstairs maid, downstairs maid. Chauffeur, cook. A cook, you can't believe. Wouldn't take that much to have a full-time cook. Take care of everything so you can devote your time to other things. If, if that pleases you. You know, Mark Hughes, my friend, has got this mansion and all this help, and that's not my style. Right? You drink a cup of coffee, you can't even set it down. Somebody comes and takes it away. That's too much help for me. I, I don't need that much help. But it suits Mark. So. But what would do it for you? Learn a new craft. Develop a whole new career greatly advance your present career. In the next 10 years, just keep making the list as many things as you can think of. Little things, insignificant to someone else, important to you. One of my goals was to have a residence in each of the four seasons. Spring here, summer here, autumn here, winter here. If you could have whatever you wanted to make your life unbelievably unique in the next 10 years, what would you take? Somebody said, you can have anything you want in the next 10 years. What is it? But you can't have it if you can't think it, if you can't, you know, describe it, if, you know, if you can't put it on paper. The ancient script says what? To the believer, everything is possible. Remember now, some close at hand, some not far away, some on out there. This is over 10 years now, over 10 years. That's a big chunk of time. How many chunks of 10 do we have? About 10. 10 chunks of 10, that's about it. Of course, with what's happening in science and technology and nutrition, you know, we may get that other... 20, 30 years before long, 110, 20, 30. Mm -hmm. I read in Scripture back when they lived to be 800, 900 years old. I don't know how come I come in this, in these generations where we get shortchanged. If I have a chance, I'm going to complain. <laughs> how come they got 800, I got 80? But that doesn't sound fair. But anyway, I may not have a chance to ask, but if I do get a chance, I'm going to ask. But in this brief life we have, we want to fill it up with as much progress and achievement as possible. Not just for ourselves, but to reach out and 
touch everyone we possibly can. Okay. Does anybody have 50 items yet? Okay, we're doing pretty good. Another couple of minutes now. Because you can put a lot more items after we do this workshop. You'll see where, you know, you don't have to stop where I stop. If you're doing it and you've got plenty of time, you just you just go on and on. Keep coaching. Say, what about this? He's, oh, somebody says, oh, yeah. And they start that. And you say, what about this? And say, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, I'd like some of that, too. Just, that's what the workshop is for. Stimulate your imagination. Ten years. It's amazing. See, kids by now to have about nine pages is already full. Adults are something else. You, you got to squeeze this stuff out of adults. Kids will have on their list things you don't even know exist, right? Okay. Put a little star there now, which means continue this later. You don't have to just be shortchanged on this list. I mean, this list can go on and on and on. And if you're working this workshop and you've got plenty of time, you just, you know, give it plenty of time till everybody's pretty thoroughly, you know, ready now with this list. Now here's what I want you to do with this list. I want you to go through the list now, one item at a time, write down the list. And I want you to give each item a one a three, a five, or a 10 by saying, that's about a one-year goal, that's about a three, that's about a five, that's about a 10. I want you to look at each item, write down the list, and give it a one, three, five, or 10. Look at each item and say, that's about a one, that's about a three, that's about a five, that's about a 10. Doesn't have to be exact, just somewhere near. Or even if you just guess, I'm, I'm guessing that that looks like about three years. This looks like about five. This is within the next year. This is ten. One, three, five, ten. going to be so valuable. What's going to be valuable now is when you teach it. You'll learn even more when you teach it. One, three, five, ten. Now remember, some goals are personal, some are family. But here's a family goal. For the kids that aren't here, I'm going to set up a few things for them that I know they want. I want to help them accomplish. Then there's business goals. Some recognition you may want. hear the brains working the way up here. <laughs> this is good stuff. Also, you know, if you're married, it's his goals, her goals, and their goals. Our goals, my goals, your goals, our goals.
Also, if something's in incredibly private, put it in code so in case this list fell into someone's hands, they wouldn't be able to figure it out. So what's a star with a circle around it? Well, never mind. It's Okay, now, here's what I want you to do with this list. I want you to look at each item that you've numbered number one, and I want you to pick out the four most important and identify them some way. Either make a new list of the four most important one-year goals or circle them or put a star or something beside it. What are your four most important one-year goals? Okay, now that you picked the four most important, one of your goals, here's the next question. Why? Why are those four goals important to you? What are they going to do for you? What will they accomplish? Why did you pick those? Why? Why are those goals important? Just three or four sentences. We don't have time to complete it, but you can complete it later. If you have plenty of time doing this workshop, you just take the time. Why are those four goals important to you? Okay, put a little star there now, that, and those little stars mean finish later, okay? Because you can continue on with this, you know, af long after this workshop is finished, and then use it as a model to teach. Remember, study, practice, teach. Now, make these notes. Next, when the why gets stronger, the how gets easier. When the why gets stronger... The how gets easier. When people don't have strong, powerful goals, the how is almost impossible. The how is too difficult. How to do it seems like, you know, how can I ever accomplish this? The how starts getting easier and easier when the why gets bigger and bigger and stronger. Now make this note. Purpose is stronger than object. Purpose is stronger than object. Object can be powerful. Ob object can be strong. But purpose is stronger than object. One of your objectives might have been a million-dollar home to live in. Here's the big question. What for? And it's the what for that pulls stronger than the million-dollar home. You know, a home is a home is a home. But what for? What are you, you going to do with this place? Well, now we start with the details. And I want you to add this note. It works in communication. It works here, too. The drama is in the detail. The drama is in the detail. Someone says, I've lost uh, 40 pounds in the last three months. We say, is that it? Those are the numbers, but what's the details? How did you feel before? Well, let me tell you what. Now they start the drama by giving us the details. How do you feel now? Wow, what a difference, 40 pounds later. And this person starts to describe what it's like now versus what it was like before. The drama is in the details. This is what you've got to do. A million-dollar home? What for? So everybody can see it from the street? That's okay, but there's got to be some more reasons. What, you, what do you want to do with this home? And then you start to say, hey, it's going to be the center of activity. You can't believe what's going to go on in this home. And you just keep describing it. And that drama now starts to really tap your imagination. 
and imagination is the beginning of reality. You can't imagine how close imagination is to reality until you start practicing this craft of turning nothing into something, imagination into tangible, the real stuff. How close is the real stuff? You can't imagine how close. If you start tapping into this resource of your imagination so that your purpose becomes much stronger than the object. The object is powerful and it'll pull, but the purpose is unbelievable. We must all pay the price, but the price gets easy if the prize gets large. The price gets easy if the prize gets sufficient. God the Father might have said to Jesus, if you die and make the sacrifice, you become the bridegroom and you inherit the bride. I'm sure he said, that's enough for me. <laughs> the bride? Yes. Then I'll easily make the sacrifice for the bride. If I become the bridegroom and I get the bride. So the price gets what? Smaller, easier, acceptable if the prize, if the promise has these incredible dimensions. Then the price, what a small price to pay. It's like disciplines. What a small price to pay for good health. What an easy thing to do an apple a day. I mean, a few things gives you such an incredible return that the price almost disappears. Promise is stronger than object. You got that? The bigger and the more powerful the why, the how gets easier and easier and easier. If I said, you know, three weeks from now we're going to do another one of these two-day seminars, and any one of you that will get 30 nice couples to put up the money and attend at this next seminar, uh, a cashier's check will be waiting for you for $50,000. How many of you could, could get the 20? You, here's what you would say, what? Easy. I would say, now we're going to do a class on how to get the 20. You would say, forget the class. <laughs> Just make sure the check is good. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Just make sure the check is good. I don't need to know how. I'll figure out how if the money's good. And we've all got that kind of imagination and ability. Somebody says, make it worth my while and see what I can do. Here's what I want you to learn to do. Make it worth your own while. Don't keep waiting for somebody to always come by, come by, come by. If they do, wonderful. What if they don't? Somebody says, I just hope somebody comes by and turns me on. What if they don't show up? Here's what's priceless. Self-motivation. Somebody asked me the other day, who motivates the motivator? I says, well, in my personal case, I motivate myself. I dazzle myself with the potential of sharing ideas and what it'll do for my future psyche of getting all of this wondrous return from people saying Jim Rohn is part of my testimonial. And it's not just the money and the treasure and the fortune. You know, I've already done that. But the rest of it, you know, I can jazz myself. My own spirit comes along and says, hey, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great? I said, yes, it sure would be great. Then I'm willing to go do another seminar or work myself to death. Self-motivation, self-control, self-development, self-esteem. And you've got to learn to work with yourself. You've got this capacity. And yes, it's fine if somebody comes along like we've done these two days and sort of stimulates and stimulates. But I want you to learn to do that on your own. Now, here's how you get better at doing it on your own. Do it for others. You say, come on, Mary, you've just been sitting around here. Let's set some goals and see if we can't stimulate you and get you going. She says, well, okay. First thing you know, you've got her going. Then you get somebody else going. And the first thing you know, now you get yourself going. Teaching is, is such an incredible experience. You can't believe what I'm going to do from the imagination that, that's gone through my mind these last two days, teaching you, teaching you. Some things have become clear to me, and I've set a whole new set of goals. Incredible when you do it, when you teach it. Okay. Now, here's another exercise. I want you to go through this list from 1, 3, 5, and 10, and I want you to count how many 1s, how many 3s, how many 5s, how many 10s, and then make a little tab list. I've got this many 1s, this many 3s, this many 5s, this many 10s. So go through and count them and make a list.
tab list of the 13510. Pretty well done. Okay, now I want somebody out here somewhere to volunteer to give me uh, your list. How many ones, threes, fives, and tens? Right down here. How many ones? Seven. Seven. Threes. Seven. Five. Twelve. Twelve. Tens. How many had no ten-year goals? Isn't that... This guy had 18. Isn't that interesting? That means he was... He did a lot of his thinking. How many ones? Just seven ones and 18 tens. That's interesting. Because he was doing more thinking way on out. You were doing more current. How many ones did you have? <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? The kind of thinking you were doing and the kind of thinking he was doing. It's interesting. So now here's what you have to say to yourself. I need more tenure goals. I'm not thinking out there enough. And then you need to say, hey. Ones, I need a lot more ones, right? Because I can put a lot of little things on there, right? And just keep checking them off every day, every day, every day. So this helps you to, to sort of get the idea that, you know, you're either sh thinking too much short term, which is fine to think short term, and you need to think long, tens. And here's why you need some of those long range goals. When the early astronauts went to the moon, a fantastic accomplishment, some of them had incredible psychological problems when they got back. Why? The question was, now where do we go? I mean, when you've been to the moon. And a lot of them had psychological problems because, you know, they did the parades and all that stuff. But when the parades were over, now what? So here's what they learned to do with the later astronauts. Because some of them, you know, drank too much and, you know, they had some problems. So here's what they learned to do later. To make sure that the astronauts that came back from the moon had plenty more projects to go for after they came back from the moon. And this is what you want now. Plenty more to go for when you've accomplished this. Plenty more to go for. Plenty more to go for. You should have seen my father's list in his 90s. Right? He had a long enough list to live to be 150. What is that called? Plenty more to go for. Plenty more to go for when this is accomplished. Plenty more, plenty more. I'll never run out of objectives and purpose to go for uh, the rest of my life. And that's what this little exercise is for. Incredible. Now, here's the last question, and we're just going to do two or three sentences now, and you can finish it later, but here is the question. What person must I become to accomplish my list of goals? What person must I become to accomplish my list of goals? What person must I become to accomplish this list of goals. Just give that a little thought and jot down two, three, four sentences. Some hard work here, and I'm telling you, the rest will unfold like you can't believe.
you can't believe the people I meet 10 years later, 20 years later saying, Mr. Rohn, that list I made, you know, up at the ranch at Clear Lake, the list I made at that two-day seminar you did, I can't believe I've checked them all off. And I added some more and checked those all off. It's incredible. Once they got going on this, it's just unbelievable. So make a little star there now that says, finish this later. And then I want you to add these notes. My mentor, Mr. Schoff, when I'm 25 years old, said, Mr. Rohn, I think you should set a goal to become a millionaire. And I thought, well, that'd be interesting. You know, a million dollars sounds interesting. And then he added this that changed my life forever. It was a twist on philosophy. Here's what he said. Set a goal to become a millionaire for what it will make of you to achieve it. For what it will make of you to achieve it. I had never thought about that before. So the major reason for setting goals is what it makes of you to achieve them. The muscle you must develop, the thinking you must develop, the skills you must develop, the person you must become, what you must know about the marketplace and how to serve the customer and how to do the deal, all the stuff you learn and become and learn and become and learn and become. That's what's valuable. That's why you go for something fairly lofty. Here's what we learn in leadership. Don't join an easy crowd where the expectations are low or where they don't care. The problem with that is you won't grow. Go where the expectations are high. Go where you're challenged to study, read, change, develop, learn the next skill. Because it's the challenge that creates the muscle. The mental muscle, the vocal muscle, the actual physical muscle to become better, stronger, wiser, more unique. And Mr. Shove said, when you become a unique person worth a million dollars, then here's what he said. Now you could give the money away because the money is not what's important. What's important is the person you have become. I got the message. Why would I do a two-day seminar? I don't need the money. Here's what I do need. The continual exercise of challenging myself to search for the vocal answers that help people to see. To struggle with the vocabulary that tries to make it clear for me and maybe makes it clear for you. Why would I give up that exercise that makes me grow year by year and develop year by year. See, I, I, I just, I wouldn't give up this unique challenge to challenge myself, to be up to date, that when the century turns, I'll be ready for it, regardless of age. Age doesn't matter. What matters is state of mind. What matters is skills. What matters is development. What matters is personality. What matters is charisma. What matters is your reach, your influence. What matters is those extraordinary things that all humans can accomplish within themselves. See, that's what matters. And if you stop that process, it isn't the matter of the money stops. What stops is your personal development stops. Lacking now the full distance of your full potential. If that stops, see, that's what, where you shortchange yourself. So if you make a million, should you go for the second million? Yes, for what it might make of you to achieve it. Warren Buffett. I mean, old Warren is worth how much? His stock is like $69,000 a share. And he started right from scratch. And why would he want any more billions? It, it's not a matter of billions. It's a matter of development. It's a matter of discovery. It's a matter of helping people. It's a matter of fulfilling. It's a matter of flourishing. It's a matter of growing. That's the deal. You don't need another billion. But what you need is the adventure. What you need is the challenge to see if you can't multiply it by two. How about multiplying it by five? How about by ten? Not in, in unworthy, greedy ambition, no. But just because you don't want to leave your life unfulfilled. You don't want to leave a game unplayed when your life finally winds down. I got a good suggestion for you. Let the end of your life find you climbing a new mountain, not sliding down an old one. You, you just keep going for it. Yes, you rearrange your schedule. Yes, you can't put in 14-hour days anymore, but that doesn't matter as long as you stay active and alive, accomplishing the next project, the next project, doing the next deal, touching the next person, building the next organization, the next enterprise, the next investment, the next something that keeps you stimulated and growing, fulfilled. That's the key. To develop a long arm, a long reach, one of the prophets said something unique about God. said, God's arm is not short. Isn't that excellent information? 
You can't think of anything more pitiful than a God with a short arm. God can't reach all the way. Why? His arm's too short. See? No, the prophet said, you don't have to worry about God. His arm isn't short. He can reach all the way. And his arm isn't short. He can reach everybody. See, that's reassuring language. A God whose arm is not short. But shouldn't that be said of every father? His arms aren't short. He's not short on vocabulary. He's not short on stories to illustrate for his kids the point he wants to make. He's not short on research. He's not short on study. Here's a good key phrase. It's okay to be a mother, but you must continue to be a student mother. To study the art of mothering as long as you're a mother. Once you become a father, you, now, you must now continue to study the art of fathering. You must constantly study the art of being a better, better, better father, more unique father. As long as you're a father, why not pick up the next idea on how to expand your influence as a father even more, even more, even more? It's okay to be a business person, but here's what you must be, a student business person. If you want to be an entrepreneur, wonderful, but continue to be a student entrepreneur. Forever learning how to increase the reach and the dimensions of your craft. Not to be short on vocabulary. Not to be short on heart. Not to be short on spirit. Not to be short on all-encompassing influence. You don't want to be short on these things. So to keep ever, ever, ever expanding the potential of your mind and your spirit and your heart and your soul and your physical capacity. You just you keep growing. And one of the reasons to grow is to accomplish this list we've just gone through. Let it challenge you to become a unique person of incredible dimensions, not necessarily in anyone else's eyes. But here's where you want to stand tall, in your own eyes. It doesn't matter out there whether someone thinks I'm short or tall, but if I stand tall in my own eyes, because I know my disciplines, I know what I'm doing, I know whether I'm doing it or not doing it, it doesn't have to be published in some local paper as long as I know that I'm paying the price, that I deserve the applause, that I deserve the prize. That's what's exciting. That's why this goal setting is so important. It challenges you to grow, challenges you to become, to move up the next level. That's key. Mm -hmm.